We're starting a new theme. Who's excited about a new theme this morning? And, uh, and, and we're going to go more of an exegetical theme uh, this month. Well, what that means is that we're going to be uh, going systematically through a book or through Scripture. We're going to be taking portions of Scripture. And, and the word that we use for that is exegeting or extrapolating truth or proper interpretation out of that. Um, you know, I, I, uh, there's a couple of common phrases in our society which we can, if we're not careful, be prone to, but it doesn't actually apply to the church. One of those is my truth. We don't have my truth. We have the truth. And, uh, and, and the other thing that we, we, uh, we have is a, is a plethora and a need for everyone to voice their opinions. And, uh, and look, we love opinions. That's great. But at the end of the day, there actually is rules around interpretation and what the Word of God actually says. And so we take portions of Scripture, and even though we can apply it to spiritual principles that benefit us personally, there is still an objective truth that the Word of God is trying to communicate to you, to us, to us as a nation, to us as a people. Uh, And so what we call that would be exegesis, is bringing that truth in proper interpretation and if you, if you want a little bit of extra detail, there are different methods, methods of exegesis, uh, or, or the word is actually hermeneutics, and the one that we apply here at this church primarily is what's called the historical grammatical uh, hermeneutic, which means that we take the text of Scripture and we ask, in the historical context of which it was written, in the proper grammar of its original language, what would the meaning be? And then we apply it to our current context. So we, if I could use bad grammar for a second, we literalize the text before we spiritualize the text. Does that make sense? And so this month, we're going to be going through more of an exegetical journey through the book of Genesis. And actually, I say this month, we're going to be doing it over two months because it's such a big book. There's actually 50 chapters that we're going to be journeying through. Uh, and so last month, we, we preached faith and we, we, we got very Pentecostal and we got our, our spirit move on. And uh, that's not going to stop, but we're going to go a little bit more Bible class for the next few Sundays. Is that all right? Are you ready for some Bible class? All right. Let's do it. Well, this morning, we're going to start, you know, uh, Genesis 1, 1 to 11 it is really considered a section that is sort of brought together and we refer to it most commonly as the history of the world. And then from Genesis 12 on, we really journey into the story of the patriarchs and the history of Israel. Uh, and so this morning, I just want to journey probably through chapters 1, 2, and 3. I want to almost set up a, a foundation for the book of Genesis that we're going to journey through. We've called this series, End from the Beginning. End from the Beginning. And to highlight this and to really set this series up as a foundation, I want to explain a principle to you that God actually starts at the end. And so when you're reading Genesis, you're very much reading the end. The book of Genesis and the book of Revelation should actually be be read together, and they mirror each other. And we know what God's going to do in the future because we know what God has done in the past. And this is very much a Hebrew way of understanding prophecy. Uh, in, in the way that we kind of understand prophecy in a, in a Western style of thinking, we would think linear, chronologically, that we're here and that prophecy would be something in the future, whereas Hebrews would think about prophecy or the Jewish people would think about prophecy as cyclical, as its history repeating itself, that there's nothing new under the sun, that whatever is going to happen in the future has already happened, and that actually it's a matter of seasons or a matter of kairos moments that we enter into. Uh, to, to illustrate this, in Isaiah 46.10, God, speaking through the prophet Isaiah, he says, declaring the end from the beginning. So God declares the end from the beginning. You might not know where your life is headed, but God does. You might not know where this world is headed, but God does. You might not know what the future holds, but God does, because he declares the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things that are not yet done. The Bible stands alone, stands alone 
as a historical text that regularly, with 100% accuracy, predicts the future. The prophetic utterances of Scripture is one of our best apologetics, one of our best reasons to believe that Christianity is truth. Because no other scripts, no other texts, no other religion can, can accurately, to the same measure, if at all, and I would say not at all, predict the future the way the Bible does. And it's because God in himself has written it into his scripture in his self-revelation to us. He's told us what's going to happen in the future as an evidence that he exists. In other words, the Bible has to be truth insofar as it was written by a being outside of time and space. So if the Bible is truth, then it has to have been written by God and not by men. And the reason and the fingerprint we have on that is that it consistently and regularly and repeatedly predicts the future with 100% accuracy. There are over 1,000 prophecies in the Bible. Over 500 of them have already been uh, fulfilled, most of which, 300 of which, have been fulfilled through the life of Jesus Christ. Now, the mathematical probabilities of all of those being fulfilled as a chance, as a coincidence, is preposterous by definition. It would be preposterous. So we can have confidence in the fact that God predicts the end from the beginning. And this is what God says. He says, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. This year as a church, we're standing on Isaiah 55.11. And that's where we are claiming word returning. We're claiming that whatever God said will come to fruition. And Isaiah 46.10 lends itself to that interpretation because it's saying, My counsel shall stand. In other words, if God said it, it's going to happen. You can go to the bank on it. If God said it, it's done. We, when we look at the Word of God, when we look at the promises of God, we, we see them as already fulfilled through the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. Even though they may be in our future, they are not in God's future because He is outside of time and it's already been fulfilled in Christ Jesus, in God, and His counsel will stand. That's why you can have confidence in the Word of God. It is fulfilled. It's already done. That's why we pray as if, as if heaven has already moved, because heaven has already moved through Jesus Christ. Ecclesiastes 1.9 says this, That which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. See, you thought that was just old farmers out west that came up with that saying. No, that's actually from the Bible. There's nothing new under the sun. Because everything that has happened is just going to happen again. It's just history repeating itself. You even look around the world today. It's just history repeating itself. We know what's going to happen. It's happened before. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure it out. Just somebody who can read history. Isaiah 48.3 says, I have declared the former things from the beginning. They went forth from my mouth. And I caused them to hear it. Suddenly I did them. Don't you love that? And isn't that the most annoying verse in Scripture as well at the same time? <laughs> it's like it's already done, but we're waiting, we're waiting and waiting, and then, and then Holy Spirit comes along, it's like, and suddenly they haven't. Yeah, well, it wasn't that suddenly, Lord, actually. <laughs> I mean, it's a matter of, matter of perspective there, Jesus. But God has declared it. And from our perspective, suddenly they happen because that's when God intended them to happen because he declared it the end from the beginning. Suddenly I did them and they came to pass. Now, let me, let me show you the history in reverse. And I've shown you this before, but this is, for those of you who haven't seen this, uh, Perry Stone does a really good teaching on this and this is where I first came across it, but I've checked this out. This is a Hebrew teaching and and this also biblically rings true, and I concur with this, and that is if you read Genesis 11 backwards, you'll read our future. If you understand Bible prophecy, you'll understand that actually it's Genesis 11 backwards. So let me, um, I'm not sure if you've actually done this up as a slide, but hopefully you have. Yes, you have. Look at that. Praise the Lord. Let's put it together for multimedia team, all right? They look after us. So from Genesis 12 on, we, you know, we, we basically understand the story of the patriarchs. Genesis 11, 1 to 11, is really the history of the world, and, it, and it's also the future of the world. 
We're living in Genesis 11 now, in my opinion. That's my opinion, but we're living in Genesis 11 now. We're living in the age of the Tower of Babel, globalization, where everyone is, is leaning towards and wanting to be coerced towards a, a globalization of speech, a globalization of understanding, a globalization of, of the economy, where they are trying to get one mind, one thinking, one speech put together and, and essentially get all humanity operating under the one government again. Uh, I, I think that's, that's not a stretch to, to say that is at least on the horizon, if not very, very close. But after that, we also see, we go to Genesis chapter 10, and we see the sons of Japheth, who were Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubai, Meshech, and Tiras. Now, for those of you who um, are good biblical scholars, you understand that that, is, that are the same tribes that are mentioned in Ezekiel 38 in the Gog and Magog war. So the same alliance of nations that will come against Israel in the Gog and Magog war are mentioned here in Genesis chapter 10. And right now we see Russia partnering with Iran and with parts of Syria. And then, you know, you've got sections of, of Turkey in there. Most of those tribes are from Turkey. And we see this alliance of nations, which 20 years ago would have just seemed absolutely preposterous, like Russia and Iran allies. Are you kidding? They were warring with each other. And now they're allies, you know, they're, they're helping each other out and they've got this conglomerate of nations. Who would have seen that coming? Well, Ezekiel saw it coming, for one. And, uh, and Genesis chapter 10 also highlighted that that's actually where the origin of these tribes came from. Then we get to Genesis chap uh, chapter 9 where we see the days of Noah. Now, Jesus said that my return will be like the days of Lot and the days of Noah. And what do we see in the days of Noah? Essentially, it's marked by a few significant things. It's marked by the shedding of innocent blood, which is certainly a fingerprint in the world today and increasing. If, if not only uh, amongst the, the, the loss of life in the, in the relentless pursuit of war, certainly in the, in the worship of, of abortion, and the way in which we pass laws around that's the shedding of innocent blood. You don't get any more innocent than a baby inside a mother's womb. And it's relentless. And on top of that, we also see drunkenness. And another thing that marks the age of Noah and Lot is the over-sexualization of all depravities. You name, you, you, probably you shouldn't, but you could name any sexual depravity and it's alive and well today. And so we see that increasing. Well, then in chapter 8, we see the dove, the Holy Spirit outpouring. And I believe there is still a great revival, another outpouring, an increasing of Holy Spirit amongst the earth today. And I believe it's already started that there is a fire burning, kindling that is just increasing in its intensity. We go to chapter 7 where we see great and tumultuous weather events. I certainly believe in climate change, certainly. I'm not sure if a tax is going to fix it. I'm not sure if, if cow's methane is causing it. But what I do know is that Matthew 24, Jesus said that there is going to be earthquakes and pestilences and this is going to increase as I come closer. And I also see in Romans that it says that a creation is yearning for the revealing of the sons of God. And so I see that, yes, creation will certainly increase in its groanings and creation will certainly increase in its tumultuous events as we get nearer to the day of the Lord. We see in... In, in chapter 6, that evil was filling the thoughts of every man. And once again, we've got time to go into that, but that is certainly the world that we live in. And then in chapter 5, Enoch was raptured. All right. Praise the Lord. I'm glad you're looking forward to that. Enoch, we see as a picture of the church, was raptured in chapter 5. Then in chapter 4, we see Cain killing Abel, which is a picture of once the church is gone, I'm telling you, righteous blood will be spilt unrelentlessly. And then in chapter 3 is the predicted defeat of Satan. We're about to have a look at that. Chapter 2 is the seven-day rest, the thousand-year reign of God, the millennial reign. And in chapter 1, everything was perfect and made again in the new heavens and the new world. You see how that's, that's history in reverse, but it's actually our future moving forward. Why? Because Jesus, God declared everything, the end from the beginning. It, it, isn't God's word fascinating? Isn't it fascinating? You can't make this stuff up. It's incredible, the fingerprints of God in this scripture, in the entire text. It's, it's not separate stories. It's the same story. It's everything that is being concealed and revealed in scripture 
is, is, is for us to lay of hold of and search out because God is wanting to get a message to you and a message to us of his glory, his will, his salvation, his redemption, so that he can call whosoever into his kingdom. And, and, and in that letter, in that message, he's put his fingerprints of his sovereignty and his majesty through it for us to discover. Well, what's the point of this? Okay, well, it, that's all very well and good and, and, uh, and great, but what does it mean to me today? Well, let me just give you three real quick ones before we actually get into the book of Genesis. And, and that is that in, uh, I believe the church will end the way it began. Uh, the great outpouring of Holy Spirit in, in Acts chapter 2, great, great apostles and teachers and apostolic anointing, uh, the, the, the greatest miracles and, and teachers and, and preachers are yet to come, are yet to be. We, we, got more, we got more Pauls, we got more Peters, we got more Apostle Johns coming. We got, we, got great, we got great men and women of God who are going to partner with that, once again, that great outpouring of Holy Spirit. And I believe it's not only just like the 12 in the beginning, I, I think there's going to be a, a, a complete anointing across the generations, old and young, that, that He's going to pour out visions and dreams on old people and young people and male and female, that the whole church, the bride, is getting brighter and more glorious as we, as we come to that return, as we come to that rapture moment. I also believe that you yourself, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, you are being worked on to the end glory of Jesus Christ, where it says that being confident of this very thing, that He who began a good work in you will complete it. Until the day of Jesus Christ, tap your neighbor and say, God is not finished with me yet, but he's already done. And that just confused you all, didn't it? <laughs> Ephesians 2.10, just to give another rapid fire verse on this. For we are his workmanship. We are his masterpiece. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared when? Before, before the foundations of the world were even laid, he was working on you. He came up with you even before creation began. And he made you a masterpiece. He started with the end in mind and then worked his way backwards. Tap the other neighbor now and say, I am a masterpiece in Christ Jesus. To start this series, I want to tell you three things. Something profound, something true, and something simple. Something profound, something true, and something simple. There's three things I want to start this series off with. And that's, that's the very first one, something profound. The profound thing in God is that you are already completed as his masterpiece. And he is finishing his, his, his handiwork as he forms you more into the likeness of Christ. That is something that we need to lay hold of, that we are the finished work of God, that he sees you in the same way that he sees Jesus Christ. He loves you the same way that he loves Jesus Christ. Why? Because God doesn't start at the beginning and just hope it works out. No, God is working to a perfect plan and he will complete it. He will finish it. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. But let's move on to something true. Let's get into the book of Genesis. In, in Genesis chapter 1, um, let, let me start here actually. Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, probably a good place to start for Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We believe that. And there's a couple of ways you can turn here and some great Christian thinkers um, uh, suggest that this was maybe theistic uh, evolution at play, that actually this creation, this, this creation story happened over millions of years, billions of years where, whatever figure they want to put on it. Um, I, I don't personally subscribe to that. And if you do, um, you, you're certainly in, in, in company of some very smart Christian thinkers. Um, however, I, I do believe, like I do the rest of the Bible, in my particular rules of hermeneutics or interpretation, that literally and historically in the proper grammar that it was written in, a six-day creation is, is what I believe. And, and just even logically, if I could just add this in, like I, I don't see why creating the whole universe in six days is any bigger miracle than creating it in six billion years. I, I, don't, I don't like, he's God, he's omnipotent. He could probably create it in six seconds if he wanted to. Uh, so, you know, but for me, I, I, I read it, that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. 
If we don't believe that, whether it's over, take time out of it for a second. If you don't believe God created the heavens and the earth, then you're going to have big problems with the rest of what the Bible has to say. Like that, that's where it starts. That's the Genesis, pardon the pun. Like God created this whole thing. And, and if you believe that, then you believe a couple of things. One, he is the objective uh, moral lawgiver of the universe because he created the whole thing. What he says goes. He is the ultimate authority. He is outside of time and space because he created time and space. He has no beginning. He, he, he's, the, he, he's the unmade maker. He is the uncreated creator. He is God. And so if you believe Genesis 1-1, then you're on a good track to understand what else the Bible has to say about that. Once we start undermining God created the heavens and the earth, then we've got big problems with the rest of the story of redemption. But listen to this, because this will blow you away. Then God said, let us make man in our own image, according to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Lauren would love that verse, because she likes creeping things. I don't. They're from the curse. No, they're not, apparently. Apparently this is before the fall, but anyway, I'll talk to Jesus about it later. So God created man in his own image. You are not an accident. You didn't come from soup, from sludge, from slime, or from some ancient planet that aliens seeded some fairy dust and migrated here over fliptillion years. You were made in the image of God. There's intrinsic value to you. You are not an accident. You don't lack purpose. Your life has meaning. Your life has purpose. You are here because Father intended you to be and you have a specific, unique fit in His master plan of demonstrating His glory to all the ages. You. You are made in His image. You are a son of God. You are a daughter of God. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. i oh, leave that alone. <laughs> then God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Not only were you made with the image of God, you were made... As the governor of God, you were made his governor on earth. You were made to rule over that garden. You were made to rule over that creation. You, you were given the authority as the, in the family business to take God's glory and multiply it. The natural created environment of humanity is in the image of God with the authority of God to multiply the glory of God. Through the blessing of God. That, that, that is, that's your natural state of being. That's what you were made to be. And we cannot question that. And if it, that comes to, we go back to what we were made to be. A.W. Tozer says this, The doctrine of man made in the image of God is one of the basic doctrines of the Bible. It's one of the basic doctrines of the Bible. It's, it's the start. You were made in God's image. You will sort a lot of stuff out in your life if you just hold to that. You'll get rid of a lot of stinking thinking if you just actually understand that you were made in God's image. And get a lot of that, that, that trifle out of your brain that's been fed there by media and, the, and at times the education system. If you just come back to the truth, and we, we discovered something profound, this is now something true. You were made in God's image. It's a basic doctrine of the Judeo-Christian worldview. It's one of the basic doctrines of the Bible, but here's the thing. And one of the most elevating, enlarging, magnanimous and glorious doctrines that I know. Which is why Satan attacks it relentlessly. That's why Satan attacks it relentlessly. Imagine a people made in the image of God who actually believed they were made in the image of God. Imagine a people who took that seriously and understood the glory for which they were created to be a part of in Christ Jesus. Wow, that would be a powerful church. 
Let's move on to Genesis chapter 2 because the story goes on. This is the history of the heavens and the earth. And they were created in that day and the Lord God made the earth and the heavens before any plant of the field was in the earth and before any herb of the field had grown. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth and there was no man to till the ground. But a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. See, God spoke everything else into being, but when he got to man, he actually formed him. He molded him. He created him. He got his hands on him and he, he shaped him. And it got even better than that because uh, then he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. God fashioned humanity. But here's where it gets cool. He then breathed his spirit life, God's spirit life, into Adam. See, if the animals, if they pass away, they pass away. But humans have the life of God in them. And they are eternal beings. You will live on somewhere. With God or without, you will live on. Because you have got the eternal life of God in you. There will eternity is in your heart. It is in your spiritual DNA. And we have an invitation that we have accepted to live on in eternity with the giver of that life, God himself. But as if it wasn't good enough already, God then planted a garden eastward in Eden and there he put man whom he had formed. And I've said this before, but as a way of repetition, this was a garden specifically made by God for man, and man was placed there as an act of grace. Adam did not earn his way into the garden. You didn't earn your way into God's good graces. He gave them to you. He placed you in his grace. He fashioned your life. He breathed his life into you, and then he placed you in his grace. That's the story of humanity before it got messed up. But then it does get messed up. And we come to a section of the Bible I refer to as fruit, fig leaves, and fables. Because there was certain fruit that God said, you can have this garden, it's all yours, but there's a section that uh, you can't touch. And it's the knowledge of good and evil. Don't touch that fruit because... Either you're not ready for it or you were never intended to have it, but whatever reason was, we don't know the specific reason outside of the fact that God in His sovereignty as the unmade maker, as the one who created the whole thing, Genesis 1.1, in, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, in that authority, that sovereignty, God said, don't touch. And in the act of touching that fruit, it was much more than disobedience, it was a removal of God from His sovereign place. The universe worked and was ordered on God being God and humanity living under His rule. But as soon as disobedience entered in, it actually rewired the working order of the universe. And as a result, perfection then became corrupted through man's actions. And everything that now humanity blames God for ultimately was seeded in the actions of humanity couple of logical questions that we could ask at this point. Maybe you've asked them. Maybe your colleagues have asked them. Why put the tree there in the first place? Well, in our own human thinking that is somewhat limited, let's say, and be generous that we say use even 10% of our brain, we could possibly come up with some outcomes that we believe would be better than what God could come up with, with the full functioning of, not, of omniscience. And at first appearance, it might seem that it would be logical to create a perfect universe that has absolutely zero option of any sin occurring. But then, of course, it doesn't take too many days in that universe for us to realize that that, in many ways, has a logical fallacy inbuilt into it that it then removes the opportunity for there to be a genuine love relationship. If humanity was genuinely going to be made in the image of God, a love being then to remove the option of the choice and the freedom and the liberty of love at first seems cool, but at the end actually unworks the whole universe even more than what sin would. And so even though this world 
may not be the most perfect world that could have ever have been created, let me guarantee you, it is the best world in that it gives us access to the best world without coercion and without being forced to. Is this the best world possible? No, it's fallen, it's broken. But is it the best world possible to give us access to the best world, heaven? Yes, it is. This is the only world in existence where we can choose freely and willingly to accept the eternal life and love of God and step into His freedom and liberty, not coerced, not because we're forced, but because we choose to. But it even gets better again. Because not only did humanity step into suffering, because God wanted to give us choice, but He Himself chose Himself to step into our suffering. I love the way that Os Guinness says this. Christianity is the only religion whose God bears the scars of evil. Our God chose to bear the scars of evil so that we could once again experience that Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 existence. So it was filled with fruit and then it was filled with fig leaves. Adam and Eve, they decided to cover their own shame, they decided to cover their own brokenness in fig leaves. And then God comes and asks them a couple of questions, which really gives us a great glimpse into the heart of God. The first question was, Adam, where are you? And notice that Adam didn't go looking for God, but God went looking for Adam. You didn't go looking for God. God came looking for you. You were lost. You were covered in fig leaves. You were covered in shame and in guilt and in condemnation. But God came looking for you. God came calling your name. God came running after you. You were that one sheep that he relentlessly pursued because he loves you that much. But here's where the fable comes into it. I'm not talking about creation. That's not a fable. That actually happened. I'm not talking about God walking with men. That's not a fable. That actually happened. I'm not talking about a historical Adam or a historical Eve that wasn't a real person because they were real people and they really walked with God in a literal sense in a literal Garden of Eden. So that's not the fable I'm referring to. The fable I'm referring to is when the serpent came and he asked the question, which he's still whispering in humans' ears today, did God really say? That's the fable. That's the pretend. That's the fairy tale, make believe story that somehow by walking away from God or not choosing God or, or seeking something better than God or seeking something better than Jesus, that we could actually become greater than what God designed us to be, greater than Imago Dei, the image of God. That's where the fable comes into it. And so God turns up on the scene and he says, Adam, where are you? And then he says, who, who told you you were naked? Who told you you were ashamed? Who told you to go after this fable, this make-believe idea that humanity could be their own gods, that humanity could be their own source of truth, that humanity could be their own answer to their own problems? <laughs> As if we could answer our own problems. I can't even play soccer without getting injured. As if we could get ourselves out of our own suffering. And so God comes, and you might be surprised to know that God gives the very first prophecy in Scripture and He preaches the gospel for the very first time in Genesis 3. Genesis 3 is where we see the gospel for the very first time. It's where we see the first prophecy. It's where we see the first time the gospel is declared. It's where we also see the first idea of a missionary. And in Genesis 3.15, let me show you. It says he's prophesying here to the snake, to the serpent, to Satan. He says, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman. And between your seed and her seed. Who's the seed of the woman? Jesus. 
So God is prophesying here to the serpent, saying that there is going to be a child born of a virgin who's going to crush your head, going to crush your power, going to crush your kingdom, going to crush your, 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 everything that came through the curse, everything that Satan has brought, the dominion and kingdom of Satan, it's gone, it's crushed by Jesus Christ. It was prophesied here and preached here by God himself as the first time the gospel was preached. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. In other words, there will be a crucifixion. But Jesus is going to be victorious. You know, the first missionary was Jesus. The Father sent the Son. Jesus was the first missionary. God was the first declarer of the gospel. The first prophetic utterance was about Jesus. But in in Genesis 3.21, there's this little picture of Genesis 3.15 playing out. And it says this, Also, for Adam and his wife, the Lord made tunics of skin and clothed them. Now, if you just journey with me here on this just for a second, that means two things. One, something had to die for Adam and Eve to be clothed. And second of all, because of that sacrifice, God was able to remove their fig leaves of shame and cover them once again in proper clothing. And likewise, God wants to remove your fig leaves of shame. He wants to remove your fig leaves of guilt. He wants to remove your fig leaves of condemnation and self-righteousness. And He wants to clothe you again through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ with the glory of God. It's a little picture there. Something else we see the origin of or the genesis of in Genesis is, is the concept of marriage and the concept of husband and wife. And and those two Hebrew words here for husband and wife, the, the, the word for husband is chatan. And what that means is, it means groom, or it's the picture of groom. And what it means is, it means to cut in covenant. It, 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 means, it means that there has been uh, the one who joins himself to you in affinity by marriage, circumcision, or, or, or there's an affinity through, through a blood cutting. And so we see the original picture of husband is a perfect picture of Jesus who joined himself to us through the cutting, through the covenant of blood. He joined himself to us in affinity. The picture of groom is Jesus, that we were made for marriage. The the Hebrew word for bride is kala, which means perfected. Perfected. The, The picture of groom is we have to spill blood and the picture of the bride is that they are perfected. Is this not a beautiful picture of marriage? Pretty typical picture of marriage if you ask me. It's us blokes have to do all the sacrifice. (laughs) Wives are perfect. And we have to lay our lives down as Christ laid his life down for the church. I'm going to back out of that one. (laughs) Here's the thing though. Our identity is defined by the fact that our bridegroom, Jesus himself, joined himself in covenant to his perfected bride, Let me ask you again some questions that God asked Adam. Where are you? And who told you you were covered in shame? Because Jesus wants to join himself to you in affinity and he has already paid the blood sacrifice for you to be perfected in him. And if we look at Ephesians 1, we actually see this highlighted really beautifully. It says here, it almost sums up the three things. And and this is something simple that I want to leave you with. So we started with something profound. We We went to something, truth. And we're going to finish with something simple here. If we see Ephesians 1, pretty much sums up the first three chapters of Genesis and the story of humanity. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. That is your natural state, blessed with every spiritual blessing. You're made in the image of God and you've been placed in the Garden of Eden by grace. You have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. In the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us before Him, the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blame before him 
in love. You've been placed in the Garden of Eden by grace. He chose you. He made you. Even before the creation was made, He was thinking of you. Having predestined to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will. Do you know you're the expression of God's good will? You're what He thought of on a good day. God wasn't having a bad hair day when He created you. He didn't wake up at the wrong side of the bed and make you. No, you are an expression of His goodwill. He'd already had His coffee and He'd already had a good warm breakfast. And then He, then he made you out of the pleasure of His goodwill. To the praise of the glory of His grace, by which He made us accepted in the Beloved. You are accepted in Christ Jesus. So here's something simple I want to, I want to, I want to leave you with. Something real, real simple. If you, if you just want to sum up the story of humanity in those first three chapters of Genesis, and, and, and this is it, that, that God, God made you in His image to be perfect and, and blameless for good works and a demonstration of His glory in Christ Jesus. And because of Christ Jesus, by His grace, you have been placed in His garden, His perfection to live with Him in affinity because He has joined Himself to you. And here's the, something really simple, and that is that Jesus would never be unequally yoked with his bride. Jesus would never be unequally yoked with his bride. I mean, this is Jesus, the Holy One, the Chosen One, Messiah, God himself, the Son of Man. He is not going to choose an unholy, unrighteous, unworthy, down and out, poverty riddled, disease riddled, infected, worthless bride. He chose his perfected bride, you. How are you perfected? In Christ. Because He joined Himself to you in affinity. That's the design. So you might be thinking, I'm not worthy. Who told you you're not worthy? Yeah, but you don't understand my past. Who told you that you didn't have a future in Christ Jesus? Yeah, but I, I, I'm just not sure I'm worth it. Who told you? that you are not worth it, that you haven't been created in the middle of God's perfection as the pleasure of His goodwill and the demonstration of His glory. Why don't we stand together in the presence of the Lord today?